Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, okay, so uh, take a seat, be quiet, let's get started with the lecture. Um, so what we'll do today is, um, um, is really start talking about how you design control systems, okay? So last time we talked about how you specify what you want to get, right? And, uh, and now we will start looking at how you actually achieve those specifications, okay? So, um, so in particular today what we will do is look at uh, a control technique that is called PAD. PAD stands for Proportional Integral Derivative Control, okay? Um, so what we'll do is learn how you know, what PID control is, how to design a PID controller. We look at first what proportional control does, uh, you know, what it looks like, what it looks like, why would you want to use proportional control, what are the pros, what are the cons, okay? Then we look at what is, actually, first we look at integral control. And again, we look at what it is, what it means intuitively, why you want to use it, what are some disadvantages? We will finish with uh, derivative control. Again, what it is, why would you want to use it intuitively? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? And then we'll put everything together with uh, PID controllers, okay? Before we start, uh, I would actually like to show you a video that was prepared by some of my you know, former colleagues at MIT, uh, which is a nice video, uh, well, I think. Um, and let's see what, what, what you guys think, okay? Uh, let's play this thing from the beginning. Let's open the app. The technology being developed for driverless vehicles is pretty incredible. In the near future, there will be robotic cars traveling on normal roads with the safety and efficiency of the best human drivers. These autonomous vehicles use various sensors to be able to localize themselves in any environment. They are also then able to construct a detailed plan to get from their current location to any desired destination. This video will provide an introduction to how these autonomous vehicles are then able to follow their desired trajectories. Getting a vehicle to follow a trajectory may seem simple to those who have driven before, but is it? Let's take a deeper look at this in a lab setting. If we want to follow a line, but we are too far to the left, we turn to the right, and vice versa. But how much do we turn? If the steering wheel is turned a fixed amount to the left or to the right, the approach is called bang-bang control. For controlling a car, this doesn't actually work that well. The response is very jerky and uncomfortable for the passengers. Fortunately, we don't have to steer like this in a car, since there is a range of angles the steering wheel can take. One way to set the steering wheel angle is to use what is called proportional control. Rather than turn the wheel a fixed amount, proportional control steers harder the further away we are from the desired trajectory. We take a measurement called the cross-track error to define how far away from the desired trajectory the vehicle is. Therefore, the steering angle we use is this cross-track error multiplied by a scaling factor called the proportional gain. The range of values the proportional gain can take drastically alters the performance of the vehicle. As you can see from this overlay, the performance gets better as the gain increases, but at a cost. If you start too far away from the desired trajectory with a high gain, the system can spin out of control. With the best gains, proportional control returns better results than bang-bang control, but it still doesn't work that well. With proportional control, the car can be crooked when it reaches the center line. The result of this is that the controller will repeatedly overshoot the actual desired trajectory and not actually follow it. To correct this overshooting problem, we need to consider additional error measurements and use them to update our steering command. A good candidate for an extra measurement is to look at the cross-track error rate, or in other words, how fast we are moving in a perpendicular direction with respect to the desired trajectory. If we are perfectly following the trajectory, our cross-track error rate will be zero. In control theory, this is what is called a derivative term. This rate term can then be multiplied by its own gain and added to the proportional term to construct an updated controller. Now that we have two terms, we have two gains that must be tuned simultaneously. Conceptually, we can think that increasing the proportional gain will increase the pull that the vehicle feels towards the desired trajectory. Increasing the derivative gain increases the resistance the car will feel against moving too quickly towards the line. Fixing the proportional gain, if the derivative gain is too low, the system will be what is called under damped and it will still oscillate. If the derivative gain is too high, the system will be what is called overdamped and will take a long time to correct for offsets. Properly choosing the derivative gain allows the car to approach the desired trajectory quickly with a cross-track error rate close to zero. This is called being critically damped. 
Despite the success so far, for a complete controller, we're not done yet. Environmental factors or mechanical defects can change the vehicle's nominal behavior and thus the performance of the controller. For example, if there is a heavy crosswind, the vehicle will drift unless the driver counteracts this wind force with a corrective steering command. Here is an example we can easily demonstrate. Imagine our vehicle is driving along and hits a pile of rocks which knocks its front end out of alignment, and therefore a zero steering command no longer keeps the vehicle driving straight. As you can see with the controller that has been described so far, the vehicle experiences a buildup of a lane offset, or a steady state error. One way to address this problem is to add yet another term called an integral term. This third measurement sums up the cross-track error to give an indication if we are spending more time on one side of the trajectory or the other. You can see that if we sum up the cross-track errors, we obviously spend more time on one side of the trajectory. The integral term we propose is then exactly this sum multiplied by a gain. Now, three gains will need to be tuned all at once, which can be quite difficult to do by hand. If the gain is too large, the controller can go unstable, because normal controller fluctuations will be exaggerated. If the gain is too small, it can take too long to respond to these dynamic changes. When the gain is just right, the controller will be able to quickly correct for the front-end misalignment and return to its nominal performance. The combination of these three terms is then what is referred to in control theory as PID control. There are other more advanced controllers that can be used for self-driving cars, but they will all look similar to the one we have described in this video. There will always be some measurements made about the state of the vehicle which are then compared to some desired vehicle trajectory to construct a steering angle that ultimately controls the car. Hopefully this gives some insight into the control strategies that can help make self-driving cars possible. Okay. So hope that was uh, informative, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully, it's giving you some. Uh, uh, where is it? So giving you some intuition. We'll give you some intuition about you know why we are uh, designing a control structure that way. Um, okay, and then we are trying to give more substance. Um, what's happening? You go away, you go away. Okay. Uh, so we'll try to give some more substance to these ideas, you know, in the rest of the lecture, okay? So, um, okay, remember, right? So how do we set the control specifications, right? So one thing that we said is that, you know, typically, you know, somebody may want to ask you, I may give you a, say, a new reference value, right? So raise the temperature to 24 degrees, okay? And then you can say, I want you to uh, give me one second. No more Wi-Fi. Okay. Um, so somebody may, may, may ask you, so yeah, if I tell you that I want you to set the temperature to 24 degrees, I want you to, get, to give me 24 degrees, period, okay? So I don't want to have a steady state error. If I want my car to drive at uh, you know, 100 kilometers an hour, I want the car to drive 100 kilometers an hour, not at 105 or 95, okay? So that typically, you know, what we said is that, you know, whenever people tell you that they want a zero steady state error to some kind of input, that immediately translates to the number of integrators that you want to have in your forward path, in your glue transfer function, okay? No question, okay? Either the integrators are already there and then you're fine, or you had to put the integrators in your controller, period. I mean, there's no, no other option to meet that specification. Then we looked at the time domain specifications, you know, things like what is the maximum overshoot, what is the uh, settling time, what is the rise time, and what we saw is that, you know, those translate into the location of these dominant poles on the complex plane. Okay? That's something that you see easily on the root locus, for example. Um, more important, in a sense, are these uh, frequency domain specifications. You know, it's about command tracking, disturbance rejection, noise rejection, what is the closed loop bandwidth. Um, and those are typically translated into these uh, obstacles on the, on the body plot. Okay? So these are obstacles that you have to make sure that your body plot stays away from. Okay? So these are the specification. Now what we have to look at is how do we actually achieve uh, those specifications, okay? Um, there are many methods. What we will look at today is, as we said before, is a method called PID control. 
something that could be, you know, on one hand exciting, on the other hand is a little bit depressing, is that I think that somebody did some study and determined that 95% of all control systems that are in operation today are PID. Okay? No matter what people tell you in grad school or at the university and, you know, all these advanced methods, at the end of the day, PID just works, okay? And, you know, very often that's all you need, okay? Word to the wise, anything you do, just use the simplest method that achieves the objectives, okay? Even though you know more sophisticated methods, usually it's not a good idea, okay? So if some simple approach achieves the objectives that you need, go for it, okay? Uh, next time we'll also see how really PID is, you know, you can look at it in a slightly more general way that is actually very powerful, and you know, that's the next, you know, gets you to the 97% or 98%, okay, of all control systems uh, actually being used, okay? Especially for CISO, you know, single input, single output systems, PID works great uh, most cases, okay? So, how does it work? So what I'm showing here is, um, uh, let's see if this works, okay. Is your standard setup, right? We have a plant, okay? What I'm choosing here is a very simple plant, it's just a first order lag, right? So one over S plus one, it's just a single pole. Clearly it has to be a real pole, right? It's a very simple system. It's open loop stable, so no weird things about the body plots and things. It's, you know, everything is, you know, uh, you know, quite easy, okay? Now, what I would like to show, okay, so then we, we have this system, we have an output, right? And then we compare this output to a reference, we build the error, and then we take this error, multiply by some gain, in this case is five, you know, can be, you know, any number really, right? It's a number that dimensionally is something that converts a, an error in the output, so has into something that has the dimension of the input, right? Or so whatever input you give to, to your system, right? So it's a, dimensionally, it's an input dimension over output dimensions, okay? But now just five in this example, okay? And that's the structure of a proportional feedback control, okay? Now, what I'm doing here, the other components that I'm putting uh, are a, well, clearly, for example, I'm giving a step in the reference, okay? So my temperature is 18 degrees, I want to take it to 24. My speed is 60 kilometers an hour, I want to bring it to 90, whatever. Um, but also I'm in including a disturbance, okay? So disturbance is anything that can come from the outside, is an exogenous external input that affects your system, okay? Um, in most of the textbooks, you will always see the disturbance applied here at the output which doesn't make any sense at all. Typically the disturbances affect the way that your system behaves, not the value of the output. For example, what are typical disturbances? Temperature control. It's cold outside and somebody opens the window, right? So clearly then your heaters must compensate for the fact that now you have like a colder, you know, have a heat transfer from your room to the outside, right? Or it could be in the case of a car, you're driving at 100 kilometers an hour, and then you hit the slope, right? This slope is, you know, of course, the slope will, the effect of the slope will be for you to slow down, so you had to, you know, press a little bit on the gas to maintain speed, right? So we'll put a disturbance here, and I would imagine that, you know, I have this disturbance. What you will see that this disturbance is actually applied at, uh, in this example, uh, the step is at, um, five seconds, okay? So I have the, the input, I command a, a change in the input at zero, time is zero, and then after five seconds there will be this disturbance, and we'll see what kind of effect it has, okay? And then the last point is that I'm adding some, um, uh, some noise, okay? And the noise is typically something that you get at your measurements, right? So you have your real speed, the speed of the car, and then you have your tachometer, right? Um, uh, that measure the speed, but you know does that with some error, okay? And so we will see what the error, what the effect of the error is, okay? So what I'm doing here, I'm showing you some simulations 
that I obtained with different values of the gain, okay? So, um, so here um, k is equal to two, here k is equal to five, uh, here k is equal to 10, and here k is equal to 50. So what are the things that you notice? Uh, well, first of all, for whatever value, so the system was open loop stable, and then as you see, as I do my feedback, actually the system remains stable, okay? Which is good. Look at what is the steady state error, right? So the steady state error is, uh, for example, here, I remember that I'm commanding, so the reference is here, right? This is the reference. So I want to go to one, okay? So you see that, you know, this value here, this is the steady state error, right? And you see that as I make my gain larger and larger, what you see is that the steady state error gets reduced, okay? We already talked about, you know, some of these things, so you shouldn't be too surprised. Um, something else that you may notice is that, okay, not only the steady state error gets reduced, um, but also the response gets faster, right? You see that you converge to close to the steady state uh, uh, quicker, okay? Um, and the last point that you may want to observe is that the sensitivity to noise increases, okay? So, um, you know, in this case, you may see that, okay, so maybe the steady state error is large, but you see that my response is kind of, you know, nice and smooth, okay? As I increase my gain, and you get here, okay, so my steady state, I mean, <laughs> on average, you know, I get very much closer to my desired reference but you see that the effect of noise is actually much more uh, substantial with this choice of gain, okay? Intuitively, how do we explain these things? Proportional control is something that measures the error, right? So, okay, so my temperature is lower than what I want, so switch up the heater, okay? By how much? You know, <laughs> you know depending on if you set a very large gain, then just one degree too cold, and then you will just max out the, you know, your, 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 your heat control, right? Um, and vice versa, right? So you see that here what you're doing, clearly you're reducing the steady state error because you are kind of compensating very much for any most mistake. You are giving a high gain, you know, you make a large control action. Clearly also you will be reacting much faster, right? Because you know, every time there is a little, you feel a little bit cold, you just put a lot of heat in the, in the room, right? Or any time you are a little bit slower than your reference speed, you just floor the gas pedal, right? Um, right, which is good on one hand because, you know, makes for a fast reaction, but maybe it's too fast a reaction, right? So you make the people in your car sick, right? If you always, you know, flooring the pedal or hitting the brakes hard every time your speed is a, is a little bit higher, right? But also you see that the sensitivity to noise increases, right? Now your speed was just fine, just your sensor tells you that you are one kilometer an hour faster than you should be, and you slam on the brakes. Well, that's probably not what you want, right? Okay? So, so this is like intuitively, right? Now, something that I like to do is, I always like to think of time domain, frequency domain, root locus, all these things, these are really the same. Okay, and I would like you to think about of all these things as being all the same and look at what happens in the time domain, but also what happens on the root locus, right? And what happens on the body plot, because these are all different ways of looking at the same thing. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, in a sense, you know, there are, there are many reasons, right? So essentially here what you're trying to do is you're trying to guess what is the right 
control input to, uh, to use, right? Ideally, you would like to use zero because that's your equilibrium, right? But then you notice that zero is not enough, right? So then you take the error, you multiply by something, and you achieve the new value of the control input, okay? But now, using proportional, you see, the, the problem with proportional feedback is that you need an error to generate a non-zero input, right? So if you were to get to the point where you have zero error, your professional feedback will tell you, well, the right control input is zero, which is not what you want. You see? You need to, gen to have some error in order to generate a, a non-zero control input, okay? Then clearly, as you make the proportional gain higher and higher, then you need smaller and smaller errors to generate the correct input in a sense. Okay, did you get the intuition? Okay, uh, there are ways that you can get that to zero, okay? But, uh, but essentially when you're using proportional control, then you need some error in order to generate a non-zero control input, okay? Meaning that you cannot get the, the error to zero, okay? Now you could do that if you had feed forward, right? So with feed forward, you can actually get the error to zero but that is only if your feedforward model is exactly correct. If it's not exactly correct, then you will always have a little bit of an error, okay? Okay, so what happens on the root locus? Okay, so the root locus is, uh, okay, so this is a little tiny here, okay? So this is, uh, this is MATLAB. Um, so let me actually write, so, you have just one pole here, okay, at minus one, right? So it's one over S plus one is the open loop, so you have a pole at minus one. What does the root locus look like? Well, as I increase the gain, as you will see, the root locus just looks like that. So what it means is that as I increase the gain, my closed loop pole will be uh, on the real axis, on the negative real axis, and will get be more and more negative, right, as I increase the gain. Which is great, right, because what it means is that, okay, so I will make my closed loop system stable, and my closed loop pole will become faster and faster and faster, which gives me the faster response, okay? So, um, right, so this is what you see here. So the closed loop pole is, you can also do the algebra, it's very simple in this case. The closed loop pole will be at minus one, minus k. So you see that by making k, positive and large, you make this pole faster and faster on the negative, <coughs> in the negative half plane. What happens to the steady state error to a unit step? Remember the calculation, right? So the steady state error to a unit step is this, essentially what we are doing is we are setting as an input e to the power zero t, which is one, right? Um, and then the steady state value of the error will be this limit which in this case takes the form of one over one plus k, right? We did this calculation you know, in the pre you know, last lecture, okay? So again, what you see here is that no matter how large k is, the error will always be finite, right? Because you need some non-zero error to generate a non-zero input, okay? Of course, I can make k as large as I want, which will make my error as small as I want, but can never be zero. And what are some of the consequences, you know, some other consequences of, you know, uh, let's look at it on the body plot, right? So, um, you know, again, this is for k is equal to two, this is for k is equal to five, k is equal to 10, k is equal to 50. What is the effect of increasing the gain on the body plot? The only thing that you do is just shift the magnitude plot up. Okay, so what do you notice? Um, so what happens to the to the um, uh, to the phase margin? Okay, well the phase margin is what you have to do is look at the places where you know your magnitude plot crosses the zero dB line. Okay, so then what you will have is just what is the distance from this phase to minus 180 degrees, well, I mean, if minus 180 is around here, uh, you see that actually your 
your face margin is actually quite large, right, in all of these cases, okay? So the face margin in all of these cases is actually more than 90 degrees, which is plenty, meaning that your system not only is stable, but is also kind of like a very robustly stable, very far away from, being, from becoming unstable. However, something that you will see is that, um, and you see that here, you see that as I increase my gain, the crossover frequency increases, okay? Which is reflected by the fact that what I have is that as I increase my gain, my closed loop will become more responsive, the bandwidth of the closed loop will increase, uh, all those things. That is in principle good, right? Aside from the fact that you can make your passenger sick, you know, maybe, you know, some way of being a little bit too responsive. But the other effect that you see is that, uh, now imagine that the noise is something that only appears, say, uh, the noise is from, uh, actually in the, in the example, the noise is essentially from about 100 hertz onwards, okay? So this is the region where you have noise. And then what you see is that actually the amount by which you are amplifying noise is much larger when I have the high gain than the, when I have the low gain, right? So and this is by a factor of, uh, well, let's say difference from here to here is a factor of 10, right? Okay, so, um, and you know, this is summarizes again, you know, all of the effects of this uh, proportional gain um, closed loop is stable, you're increasing the crossover, you're increasing sensitivity to noise. Okay? Clear? Okay. Uh, you see how, you know, you can see, you know, the message is the same, right? But you can kind of emphasize different aspects by looking at root locus, body plot, all these different tools that we have looked at in the, in the you know, for the past couple of months. Okay? Now, as we said, we, we can make that error zero. Uh, so we can make that error, error smaller. We can never get it to zero, but also if we want to make it closer and closer to zero, we have to increase the gain, which also means that we are increasing sensitivity to noise. So is there a way that we can actually achieve both a smaller error? In particular, can we get the, zero, the steady state error to be zero? while also being not too sensitive to noise, okay? And actually the way that you do it is by introducing this integrator, okay? What does the integrator do? What is this steady state error, right? So you saw in the example in the video on the car, right? So essentially your wheels are no longer aligned, right? So now you think that you're steering the wheel by a certain angle and actually you're off by some other angle. So what you see is that no matter what you try to do with your with your, um, uh, with your steering wheel, you're always driving, say, one meter to the left of, the, of the, where you want to drive, okay? You know, it happens at one point in time, say, well, what the heck, you know, I will try to compensate for that, right? But then it keeps, you keep having that offset, right? And maybe instantaneously you don't think much about it, but as this error keeps nagging at you, right, so you, can I just, what the heck is happening? So maybe, maybe I should try to, um, uh, to steer even more, right? So it's kind of, you know, <laughs> um, maybe you have this neighbor, right, that is doing something that's really not that, is not bothering you too much, but he keeps doing it, right? So that after a couple of months, you start talking to him, right? So please don't do that anymore, right? So essentially it's the same thing, right? So you have some error, and you see that this error doesn't go away, keeps nagging at you, right? And then after a while, essentially you build up this integral of the error and you start taking action. It's exactly the same thing, okay? So, and essentially what you do is you look at the error, this proportional control, then you look at the integral of the error, right? So if you have an error that is, keeps oscillating, the integral will be zero, right? So <laughs> roughly zero, so you kind of ignore it. But if the error is always in one direction, this integral will start growing, right? And then you multiply that integral by some gain, ki, and then you are building up another control action, which is called this uh, integral action, okay? So this is what the uh, control input looks like in the time domain. 
in the frequency domain, uh, remember that, okay, so you, you can look at it this way, right? So we take the error, multiply by some proportional gain, uh, but then we take the error, we integrate it, multiply by some integral gain, then we add the two, and that's how we generate our control, right? Remember that the, um, the transfer function of an integrator is one over S, right? So then, and you know, we have a parallel of these two things, so the controller is really KP plus KI over S, which I can rewrite with some algebra. And then essentially what you see is that now I have a dynamic compensator, right? So it's a dynamic controller, it's a transfer function. And essentially I have a pole at the origin, that's the integrator, and then I have a zero, okay? And I can set the position of the zero, right, as, you know, you know uh, by choosing the ratio of KP and KI, okay? And essentially that's what we will have to do. Okay, so now what I'm doing here is I kept the uh, proportional gain to two, okay? Because that's something that I liked because, well, the steady state error was large, but actually my response was very insensitive to noise. So I, I like the low sensitivity to noise, what I didn't like is the large steady state error, okay? So since the integral action will actually fix the steady state error, let's keep the proportional gain at two, and let's see what, what is the effect of increasing the integral gain, okay? And then what you see is the following, right? So the blue line, you know, now it's kind of, I don't want, uh, okay, let's write here. So this is k is equal to two, this is k is equal to five, the yellow line is k is equal to 10. Uh, sorry, the legend here was wrong. Um, so this is five, this is 10, okay? Um, and this is k is equal to 15, okay? So now what you notice is the following, that for all the values of k, of ki, what is the steady state error? Steady state error is zero regardless, right? As long as you get a non-zero, you get like a positive integral gain, then your steady state error will go to zero, okay? And that's why I say, you know, whenever somebody tells you I want a zero steady state error to a unit step, just put an integrator and that's your solution, okay? So you're achieving that, okay? Um, but then what you will also see is that if I increase my, uh, my, uh, integral, uh, my integral gain, what you will see is that actually the response does get faster, right? So, and you know, for example, you see here that the effect of my disturbance is rejected very quickly, you know, like faster if I use a larger, a higher integral gain. However, another thing that you notice is that yeah, the response is faster, but it starts oscillating, okay? In linear control, every time you see something oscillating too much, it's a red flag, okay? What it means is that your damping ratio is getting very small, your phase margin is getting very small. So if your system oscillates too much, it's probably very close to being unstable, okay? So what you see here is that the response as I increase my integral gain becomes more oscillatory, which is always a warning. Also something nice that you notice that, okay, so now what I have achieved is a way of getting my response to have a, like a zero, exactly zero steady state error without sensitivity to noise, right? So we kind of like a fixed both of those bad things of the proportional control. What is the bad thing? Is that we are oscillating more if we choose an integral gain that is too large, okay? Let's look at the same thing from other points of view. What is happening on the, um, on the root locus? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, you can do the calculation for the steady state error to unit step. Lo and behold, you get zero, right? So this calculation that we did last week. Now, um, what you see on the root locus is the following. So remember that, um, um, let me draw another sketch of the root locus here, okay? 
the root locus looks something like this, right? So we have a pole here at negative one, right? So this is the pole of the open loop, right? Then we are adding another pole at the origin because that's the integrator of my, of my controller, right? And then I have a zero, right? Well, what is the location of this zero? Uh, look at um, the location of the zero is negative ki over kp, right? Um, negative ki over kp. Okay. What does the root locus of this system look like? So this is on the root locus, right? This is on the root locus. So the two closed loop poles will, as I increase my gain, will move, you know, towards here. They will meet up, split off, and then they will join again on the real axis. One will go to the zero, the other one will go to minus infinity, right? So see what, what, what is happening is that as I increase my gain, the you see the location of the pole? So, well, first of all, as I increase my gain, the zero gets moved farther to the left, right? Or to your left, that way, um, okay? And then as you, as you can see here, well, I don't know if it's, you know how clear it is, but you see that um, for the larger value of the gain, the closed loop pole is actually here, okay? What you see that is that the damping ratio of this pole is very small, right? So this pole is actually quite close to be to the imaginary axis, okay? And then, you know, that's something that tells you that, you know, uh, we are getting close to instability, right? So very, very low damping ratio uh, is usually a sign of danger, okay? What happens on the body plot, right? So um, what is the body diagram of your compensator? What does it look like? So your, my compensator, my controller is C of S is equal to, what did we say? Uh, is KP that multiplies um, what is it? Oh. I don't know. Okay. So it's ki that multiplies k um, kp over ki s plus one over s. What is the body plot of this? This something looks like uh, so the body gain is ki, right? So this is something that comes at the slope of negative 20 dB per decade from the left, and that at the location at Ki, um, say, at the location Ki over Kp, it goes flat, right? Because now you have the effect of the zero, okay? Uh, so this is the magnitude. Uh, what is the phase plot of this? You come, you come in at uh, negative 90, right? So that's the integrator, right? And then around Ki over Kp, you will essentially get to uh, zero, right? So the phase plot will be something like that, okay? So you see what is happening here is that um, what is the effect of adding this compensator to your open loop transfer function? Essentially what you're doing is you're increasing the gain at frequencies that are lower than the zero of, the, of this PI controller, okay? But you're also decreasing the phase at those frequencies, okay? So the effect of increasing the gain is good 
because remember that the steady state error is proportional to one over the uh, low frequency gain, right? So we are making the, the, the gain at zero to be infinity, which means that my steady state error will be zero, okay? But also remember that we are introducing a phase lag, right? And the phase lag may reduce my, my phase margin, okay? So let's look at what happens uh, you know, on the body plot. What you see is that the, as I increase the gain, right? What you see is that the phase margin actually decreases, right? So my phase margin for k is equal to two was 90 degrees, which is fantastic, great, right? But then as I make my k larger and larger, you see that there is this phase lag and the phase margin actually gets to be as small as, you know, I don't know what it is in this case, say 25 degrees or something like that, okay? On the other hand, you see that the crossover frequency increases, right? So the crossover, you see that, uh, you know, um, the crossover, the point where you, where your magnitude plot intersects the zero dB line shifts to the left, to the right, meaning that your system becomes more responsive, right? That may be good. Um, and um, the low frequency gain increases, right? But in whatever K is, when you go to zero, the low frequency gain always goes to infinity, okay? So all of this will give you a zero steady state error, okay, during this step. And now something else that you may want to notice is that Look, look at what happens at high frequency. No matter what my choice of K is, at high frequency I have absolutely no change, meaning that my PI controller does not increase my sensitivity to high frequency noise, okay? You can also see it from here, right? So you see that the contribution of my PI controller at high frequencies is flat, okay? Essentially it just works as a normal gain. Okay, any questions? Sounds good? Okay, so um, now what I would like to do is, okay, so now we have learned about proportional control or some aspects of proportional control. We have learned about integral control, okay? So why we want to have it. Um, so in a summary, so, Integral control allows you to get zero steady state error to unit steps, right? Or to higher order ramps if you want, just put more integrators. Um, what is the bad thing of integral control? Integral control gives you a 90 degrees phase lag, right? Meaning that it reduce, can reduce your phase margin, essentially can make your system more unstable, okay? Let's continue afterwards, uh, after the break, we have some new uh, CSOs for you guys. Okay. okay, let's get back to the lecture. Okay guys, please sit down. Okay, um, we looked at proportional, we looked at integral. Uh, now we will start looking at derivative control, okay? And in order to introduce the effect of derivative, of derivative control, what I will do is look again at proportional control, but in the case in which we have a higher dimensional system, like a higher order system. In particular, I'm looking at the case where we have a second order system, okay? Again, it's stable. Um, you know, the pole zero map for this, the poles are actually at um, um, minus one plus or minus j, okay? So, yeah, the system is stable, just second order, okay? And now let's see what happens if I try to control this using proportional control. As we saw before, as I increase my gain, my steady state error becomes smaller, okay? Sensitivity to noise becomes larger. But also you see something else here. As I increase my gain, 
my system becomes faster, but again, starts oscillating. Anytime you see lots of oscillations, it's typically bad news, red flag, getting close to instability, okay? Um, so now what you would like to do is, how can we, uh, and you know, this is typical of second order system, right? So second order system, um, you can control it with proportional gain, but usually as you increase the gain, then the damping ratio becomes smaller and smaller, the robustness margin, stability margins become smaller, okay? Usually not, great, not a great idea. But what is it that you can do? So now this is actually something that can remind you of the car example, right? So something that, you know, why, why is this thing that is oscillating so much around here? So essentially what I'm, I'm overcompensating, right? So, okay, I'm to the right or where I want to be, let's steer to the left. And then you start steering to the left, and then you cross your, say, reference path at too steep of an angle, and there's, oh my goodness, I'm on, you know, too much on the other side, so I had to turn, you know, back where I was coming from, right? And you keep doing this, right? So now something that you may want to do is, what if you were able to think about, okay, so for example, let's say that I'm here, okay? Okay. And here what I can do is I can look at what is my derivative, okay? And then if I say, you know, hold on a second. Yeah, I'm still to the right of where I want to be. But I see that my derivative is very much to the left. So should I keep turning more? Probably not, right? Um, so then, you know, what you want to do in that case is maybe you want to steer a little bit left, you know, a little bit less, okay? So, and this is essentially the... Uh, you know, the idea. Um, okay, but anyway, so, so what is happening in this case, uh, you know, on the root locus, what you see is that, okay, so my, uh, uh, my open loop poles are here and here. What does the root locus look like? Well, it's just this way and this way, right? So then as you see, as I increase my gain, my closed loop system remains technically stable, but the damping ratio is becoming smaller and smaller. Okay? Steady state error is the same as computed before. What happens to the, on the body plot? Okay, so proportional error, so this is the body plot of my uh, open loop, this is the face. And as I increase k, what, what I'm doing, I'm, increase, I'm just moving the magnitude plot up, right? And what happens is, okay, fine, I'm increasing the crossover frequency, right, because I crossed the zero dB line at higher frequencies. But also what I'm doing, if I look at the phase margin, you see that the phase margin is getting closer and closer to zero, right, because my phase at crossover is getting closer and closer to negative 180 degrees, okay? So, again, these are all different ways of seeing the fact that as I increase the gain, my closed loop poles get closer and closer to the imaginary axis, which is something that I don't want. How do we fix this? As I was saying before, essentially looking at the derivative of the error, you kind of have a preview of what your error will do in the near future, right? Okay, so you can predict what the error is going to do, Right? And then you can try, so if you see that you're getting closer to the objective, but you're going too fast, then you can say, you know, hold on a second, you know, slow, you know, slow down a little bit, right? And essentially you can avoid overshooting, okay? And, you know, you can see this also as a damping, you know, increasing damping on the system, okay? So this is what the PD control looks like in the time domain. In the frequency domain, what you have is just, you know, is your proportional gain, plus the derivative part. Remember that the derivative in the transfer function of the derivative is just S, right? The parallel, and what you get, this is the transfer function of a PD controller, okay? Now, something that I would like to warn you against is the following, that, yeah, this is great, right? It's great to be able to write something like this, but notice that, as we said at the beginning of the class, this transfer function is actually not causal. Sorry, as great as a differentiator may uh, look like to you, is something that you cannot realize physically, okay? So 
Typically, what you will do is you will not be able to implement this, okay? But you will approximate this as, um, say, Kp plus Kds over some, um, um, sorry, uh, let me just rewrite. What you will do is write it as Kp plus Kds over Cs plus 1, where this C is some constant that is large, okay? So essentially, this is just to say that what you have is a pole that you want to make, um, um, you know, as fast as possible, or I mean, as fast as you want, okay? Uh, no, actually, so you want you want this pole to be to be fast, um, meaning that you want to to have small small c. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so essentially, you want this this pole to be fast. Okay, fast pole. Okay, but anyway, for now, don't don't worry about this for now. Uh, just assume that we can actually implement this derivative control. Um, the only cases in which it's actually legal, in a sense, or physical, to have a derivative action, just a pure derivative action, derivative action without approximating it as a, with a fast pole, is those cases where you can actually measure the speed directly, okay? Or, you know, you, you can measure the derivative directly. In the case of the, your car, how do you compute, the, how do you measure the speed of the car? Computing the GPS position and differentiating? No. <laughs> you actually look at how quickly the wheel is turning. So actually, in the case of a car, it's perfectly legal to use uh, PD control, okay? A anytime you can actually physically measure the derivative, it's fine. If you're trying to compute it by computing numerically the derivative of something else, then it's clearly not something that you can do, okay? It's always an approximate derivative, okay? So what happens as I increase my um, my um, uh, my derivative gain? Well, I mean, what is happening is that okay. So you see, this is for the case where k is equal to two. Uh, this is for k is equal to five. This is k is equal to ten, and this is k is equal to fifty. Okay. So what you see that is happening here is that. The steady state error is not affected. Does that surprise you? A steady state, what is the derivative? Steady state, the derivative is zero, right? So what is the effect of your derivative action? Nothing, right? Doesn't matter how large your derivative gain is, right? Um, what you see is that the response becomes less oscillatory, right? But also you see that the response is oscillates less, but it's also became, becoming slower, okay? Also something else that you may notice is that the sensitivity to noise increases, okay? What happens on the, um, um, you know, on the, uh, on the root locus? Well, what happens is that uh, as you, um, you know, as the derivative gain increases, then your closed loop poles are being pulled further and further to the left on the complex plane, okay? So, which again gives you better damping ratio, gives you, uh, you know, more stability margin, okay? And, uh, you know, this again, uh, as you increase the derivative gain, what you will see is that on the body plot, the phase margin uh, increases, right? So you see it here, um, Right, so this is for k is equal to 2, k equal to 5, 10, 50. You see that you can get the phase margin to get as large as 90 degrees, right? Crossover frequency increases, the low frequency gain does not change, and the high frequency gain increases. So you're also becoming more sensitive to noise, okay? Questions? So, is that, yeah. Um, 
uh, think of it this way, right? So typically, um, um, okay, so, so this, this is not as clear here because you're also becoming more stable, right? So in a sense, you are more sensitive, but you're also reacting better to it, right? But think of it this way. Noise is this kind of like very high frequency kind of like oscillation, right? So it's a high frequency signal, right? What do you think the derivative of that is? Right, but uh, you know, since the if you have a signal that is changing rapidly, what it means is the derivative is very large, right? So now what you have is you are taking that derivative, which is the noise amplified, right, and you are multiplying by something. Okay. Um, again, it's useful to look at um, you know you may want to look at what is the body plot of your compensator. Body plot of your compensator is something that is flat, right? So there's a, there's a proportional part, right? And then, so compensator C of S is equal to KP plus KDS, right? Where, so this is a zero. Where is the zero? At, uh, what is it? Minus KP over KD, right? And then essentially what is happening here is that, um, you know, at, you see that at high frequencies, your magnitude is actually getting larger, right? The magnitude of your response, right? Or essentially your control, what your controller is doing is taking, um, is taking whatever it sees at high frequencies and multiplying by something, okay? which is technically not something that you want to do because you know that at, you know, at, you know, say high frequencies, you know, this is all noise, okay? There is no way that your driver is commanding steering angles at higher than 100 hertz, right? Or that your trajectory needs to change at faster than 100 hertz. Everything that you see there is just noise, okay? Oh, okay, yeah, good question, right? So, um, so now if you have a, um, so what I drew now is the, is the body plot, the magnitude body plot of the ideal PD controller. What we said is that we cannot implement the ideal PD controller. We always need to add a fast pole, right, to make it causal, right? So if I add a fast pole, you know, somewhere, uh, what will look like. So now just be flat at some point, right? So typically, where do you want to add this fast pole? Do you want it to be at 10 kilohertz? No. Right, you just put it, you know, past your crossover and maybe before your noise, okay? So in this particular case, you may choose to say, well, you know what? You know, I put my fast pole around here so that I limit my exposure, I limit my sensitivity to the noise, okay? We'll do more and more of this. I mean, a lot of these things will become clear in the next lecture where we do a more systematic um, design of compensator of controllers on the body plot, okay? Okay, but essentially this is the idea. So, um, um, So if you look at what is happening on the body plot and look at the phase plot, you see that the effect of the, uh, of the zero is that it gives you this phase lead, right? At frequencies that are past the frequency of the zero, okay? And the effect of the phase lead is take your phase margin that was, was very small and give it a boost, right? So make it larger, okay? So that is what, what is happening. So derivative action, what it does is, um, is 
essentially add some damping to your system so that it doesn't oscillate too much, right? So it tries to avoid overshoots, limit overshooting, limit oscillation, increase damping, okay? The side effect that you don't want is that it makes, it typically makes your system more sensitive to high frequency noise, okay? So these are the things that you need to balance. Okay, um, we have looked at proportional, we have looked at integral, we have looked at derivative control. So you can have proportional only, you can have PI, which is proportional integral, you can have PD, which is proportional derivative, or you can put everything together, right? And now you have a control design that, okay, you take your error, multiply by something, that's a proportional component. Take your error, integrate it, multiply by something, that's your integral action. Uh, take your error, compute the derivative, multiply by something, that's your derivative action, okay? So, and this is the general form of a PID controller. So then you're building in the integral component to try to get your steady state error to zero. You're adding your derivative component to try to add damping to your system, put everything together, and there's all the happy you know, family here of you know, this, this control design. Uh, this is the form on the, uh, on, in the time domain, and this is what it looks like in the frequency domain, okay? Again, notice that this is not causal, right? So this is not the proper rational function. The numerator is second order. The denominator is first order. So typically when you implement this for real, you will have to multiply this by, you know, you need to have some kind of like a fastball, okay? Uh, to add to this so that you make it a, a proper rational function, okay? Now, how do you choose these parameters? This is kind of, so I try to give you some intuition of how you set the derivative gain compared to the proportional gain and how you set the integral gain compared to the proportional gain in the cases where you only have, say, PD or PI. And that is kind of intuitive, okay? So essentially, by increasing your derivative control, you increase the damping. Uh, by increasing your integral control, you make the response faster, okay? Now, when you're doing these things at the same time, then it actually becomes a little bit tricky, okay? And you lose a lot of the intuition. So, um, you can do num several things. You can go to MATLAB, start your CISO tool, and start playing with those gains, okay? Um, after you get a little bit of a feeling of how that works, you will get better at that, okay? But that's not really the recommendation that a professor should give you, you know, teaching a class, right? Uh, <laughs> should have something a little bit more systematic. So, something that you often see in textbooks is a bunch of rules to tune your PID, okay? And what you will find in the, actually both the textbooks that are recommended is uh, a bunch of tuning rules that go under the name of uh, Ziegler and Nichols, okay? I do have some slides on these rules, you know, in this deck. We may go through them if we have time. Looks like we have time. Honestly, this is one of the things that people do in the textbooks because it's tradition, because people have done these things for 50 years. Let me tell you that in my career, I, not a single time I've ever used Ziegler Nickel. Okay. Do you need to look at it? Maybe yes for completeness. My preferred way of setting, of tuning PID controllers is actually a little bit different. My preferred way is to just forget the fact that you have three gains. Okay. Don't think of it as a proportional control, the proportional gain, integral gain, derivative gain. The way that you can think of it is the following. So if you look at that transfer function, at this transfer function here, you see that you have a second order polynomial at the numerator and you have just a pole at the origin, okay? Now, don't think of this as a second order polynomial, think of it as the product of two, two 
you know, um, um, you know, first order po yes, polynomials, right? What it means is that, you know, you can think of a PAD as a controller that you obtain by adding a pole at the origin, that's the integrator, and then you can put two zeros wherever you want. Okay? So then decide where you want those two, two zeros to be, place those two zeros, do all of your root locus, you know, you can either choose those two zeros on the, on the complex plane, you know, you want two zeros on the real axis, you want two zeros that are complex conjugate, you cannot have a real zero and the complex conjugate like a complex zero, right? So either you put both of them on the real axis or you put them, um, you know, on the, uh, in, in the compl you know, as complex conjugate. You can either do that or you can decide what is the natural frequency of these zeros that you want and what kind of damping you want on those, uh, on, on those zeros if you do that on the body plot, for example, okay? <clears throat> Once you've decided where these zeros, where you want these zeros to be, then go back, do the calculations, and get the, and whatever multiplies the S squared term, that's your derivative gain, whatever multiplies your S term is your proportional gain, whatever multiplies your zero order term is your integral gain, okay? You, you, you see what I'm saying? Don't think of this as proportional integral derivative gains separately, Think of this as where you want to add the zeros, and that works. Okay, that's what I do. This ziegler nichols thing is only something they look at when I had to teach the class, and then immediately forget. Okay, so you choose. Okay. Um, anyway, um, let me give you some. So we'll do more and more of this, and in particular, we will see that PAD control. You can also think of it as a, like a special case of a more general class of controllers that we will look at next week. As a summary, um, okay, so proportional control. You want to use, you want to increase the gain, right, because you want to, you know, can decrease the steady state error. Proportional control can increase the closed loop bandwidth, that is, increases the crossover frequency, right, that we saw is essentially the closed loop bandwidth. Whoever can increase the sensitivity to noise and can reduce stability margins for systems of, you know, say, second order or more, okay? First order system, you can make the, you know, the control gain as large as, as you want because the, the phase margin will always be at least 90 degrees, so who cares, okay? But in the second order system, your, your phase will eventually go to negative 180 degrees, meaning that your your phase margin can get very small. So you have to be careful with proportional control. Integral control, the nice thing, and you know, the only reason why you want to have integral control is that it reduces the steady state error to exactly zero, okay? Steady state error to a step, okay? No other way that you can do it. If you want your steady state error to be zero, you have to have an integrator, period. No other choices, okay? The problem with, uh, with, uh, with the integral control is that it can reduce the stability margin, right? So it reduces the phase margin because it, it's giving you an extra phase lag of 90 degrees at low frequencies, okay? So yeah, integral control is great as long as it does not destabilize your system, okay? Remember that the steady state error is zero, but only if your closed loop is stable, okay? So always check that when you're doing integral control. Derivative control is also fantastic because reduce overshooting, increases damping, improves the stability margin because it gives you potentially a 90 degree phase boost, okay? So can make your phase margin much larger. The problem is that it may increase your sensitivity to noise because now you're taking all these signals at high frequency and multiplying them by some factor, okay? And essentially that concludes, you know, the, 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 the important things that I wanted to talk about today, okay? PAD, proportional, integral, derivative, we looked at what it, you know, intuition behind each one of these, what they do, pros and cons, okay? So we do have some more time, so let's look at this Nichols, you know, Ziegler, Nichols, two Nichols, okay? So, 
essentially what you do here is that you take a plant and you make this assumption that can be really, uh, can be um, modeled by something that looks like a first order plant, okay? Just a first order, right? What is this e to the power minus ts? This is something that we look at uh, in two weeks, uh, but let me tell you now, this is the effect of a time delay. Okay, so now this is a first order system with a time delay that can come from, say, the computations in your microcontroller or can be from, from anything else, okay? So then, okay, so this is very empirical, very practical, okay? So you have this system, you assume that this model can be modeled like that. Then what you do is you apply proportional feedback to your system and then you start increasing your proportional gain up to the point where the response with your closed loop system actually starts oscillating. Okay? This value where your system starts oscillating, that is called what they call this critical proportional gain. Okay? This KP star. Okay? And then you look at what is the period of the oscillation, and let's call it. T star, okay? Now, does anybody have an idea of why you may or may not want to do this? So essentially, you're trying to design your compensator by driving your system unstable, right? So you're just trying to change your controller gain, and you're trying to push the limit up to the point where you actually start seeing these sustained oscillations, meaning that you're getting your system very close to being unstable which you know, may not be a good idea, okay? Uh, but anyway, so if you do that, then, um, then depending on what kind of uh, controller you want, if you want proportional, pro PI, you want PD or you want PID, then you can set your um, 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 your proportional control as you know, this value here, this ti and td, these are the time constants associated to the integral and derivative terms, okay? Um, anyway, so essentially what you're trying to do is you're giving a, you know, this kind of like a, a you know, reference signal. You're increasing the control, the proportional gain up to the point where you start seeing this sustained oscillation, okay? From the sustained oscillation, you get the, you get the, you know, the period, this T star, and you use these numbers to set your P, I, and D gains, okay? So, uh, and, you know, so this is an example, and then you, you see why, you know, I don't really like this method, because this method is kind of complicated. You have to remember things. There are a lot of magic numbers, and it doesn't work. Anyway, so why do you want to do this? I don't know. Um, <laughs> anyway, so let's say that the plant is this. So you we kind of approximate it this way, okay? Uh, I mean, essentially, this is the best approximation I could get. Notice that the approximation is good at low frequencies, but, you know, the approximation can be pretty bad at high frequencies, right? Because essentially the idea here is that uh, um, I'm trying to approximate a plant that is, okay, so this is a third-order plant, right? So we have three... Um, 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 you know, three poles, right? So as you know, the phase of this plant of the transfer function will go to negative 270 degrees, right? And then trying to approximate it with something that is a first order plant where the phase will go to negative 90 degrees with this time delay. A time delay is something that does not affect the magnitude but affects the phase, okay? Uh, and, you know, this is... As you see, this is not a good approximation period. There's no excuse, okay? Um, so then, you know, you, you go through the rules. You, um, okay, so, so this is where you start seeing this oscillation, right? So let's say KP is 9.99, you see the oscillation. You set KP to 10, the things blows up, right? But anyway, so you get this indication to compute these, um, you know, these, these, uh, these parameters. And essentially, this is what you get, okay? So if you just do a P controller, what you get is this one, right? And, you know, as you can see, you have a non-zero steady state error. 
Same thing with the PD controller, uh, you get a non-zero non steady state error. In order to get the zero steady state error, you need to have the PID version of PI. Okay. Uh, and the, uh, what is it? This purple line is what you get out of the Ziegler-Nichols tuning method, okay? But you can go to MATLAB, CISO tool, two minutes, design something that looks like the green line, which is actually much better, okay? So, again, for some reason, everybody keeps talking about these things. I have never used them ever, and I've never seen anybody using them in a useful way, okay? So essentially, this is what people try to do in the ages in the, where before MATLAB, okay? Nowadays, there's absolutely no reason, okay? So if somebody asks you, oh, did you learn about Ziegler and Nigos? You can say, yeah, 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 yeah we learned about that. <laughs> okay, but you don't have to use it, okay? So, um, yeah, so this is my point of view. I, you know, I really... And it's much easier to just do it on MATLAB. And, and again, you know, for me, if you want to have some guidelines on how to choose these KP, KI, KD terms, just think of it as adding two zeros. Think about where you want the zeros to be and then compute the KP, KI, KD you know, as a consequence. Okay? Good. Uh, let's stop here and I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>